Henry, Bo Benry, Banana Fana Fall Fenry, me, my, Mo Menry, Henry. That is nice, man. That was a, you had a little um uh little Beyonce Lilton there going on. That was very impressive. That was well sung. All right, now let's. Uh, this is like God bless you, Henry. You, you need I, one in I'm return. I'm supposed to do it. Right? Yeah. I know. I was. I was avoiding. Uh, okay. <clears throat> Danny, Danny, Bobanny, Banana, Fana, Fofanny, Fee, Five. Me, Bob, me, my. Me, my, Mo. Mo, me, Manny. Let me try again. Danny, Danny, Bobanny, Banana, Banana. Banana. Fo, Come on, the word is banana. There's no word for banana. All right, it's true. All right. You know, it's multiple takes. Last try. Danny, Danny, Bobetti, Banana, Fana, Fofanny, Me, My, Mo, Manny. Danny. He nailed it. Oh, with the click of a pulling spring. A Red Bull, actually. What's that? You getting a text message? No, I'm getting a call from Scam Likely. Ooh, pick it up. Go put it on speaker. Okay. Hello. Hey okay. guys, I think this scam is likely. They hung up on me. Yeah, that's what happens. They don't expect you to pick up. I love you know what I love looking at now? I I do this on YouTube sometimes. I will look up uh people tape themselves like fucking with scammers that is that, nice that is satisfying seen, to watch yeah for a while i had uh, one of those um in the uh liked section of my youtube videos uh it was a guy answering a fake irs scam i did it because it the exact same thing happened to me in 2017 and a guy told me i got a live guy on the phone told me that the irs was going to raid my house mm. If I didn't pay them. Did I ever tell you about the time I got actually scammed by a phone scammer? It was actually an internet scammer. I don't know. I don't think so. I was... Okay. I don't know if I've told this story before. My mom lent me her laptop. Okay? She had a laptop that was provided for her by the New York Board of Education. Okay? All right. All right. Yeah. Now, I had it for months... It started to seem like my mom was never going to need it back again. Sure. And so I started to just use it as my own personal laptop. So I held yeah. off on watching porn on it for a long time, but then ultimately I was watching porn on it. Right, um, right. So one day I'm on the laptop. All of a sudden the computer freezes, okay? On the, the a message pops up on the monitor. It says... You have been flagged by the FBI uh, for having child pornography on your computer. Here's a sample of images. It included three images of child pornography that I had to look at. All right? Oh, my God. And then it said, what you need to do to p stop this stop on your computer and to go forward is to pay. Uh, it was like a... I don't know. It's a fine of some kind. It's like a yeah, few hundred yeah. dollars or something. And um, you have to do this by going to a CVS and buying a money pack and loading <laughs> the, it to a money pack. Right there is where it starts. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, okay. no. But I was drunk. All right. And scared. And scared and masturbating. Mm. And, uh, and then uh, this happens and it's my mom's computer from the board of education. And I'm like, right. am I going to get my mom sent right. to prison? Right. Ruin lives. Yeah. So I went yeah. and I fucking paid it. Yeah. What happened when you paid it? Nothing happened. Like, it, they, you know, they didn't, the thing was still on the computer. Like we had a virus and like I had to just trash the computer and uh, I lost a few hundred dollars. Did you realize it was... When did you realize it was a scam? On the way it? home from CVS. Oh, it just occurred to you? you I was like, meeting Nathaniel yeah. later that night. Mm -hmm. And he was like in town. And it was like I started to go over the story in my head because I knew I was going to have to recount it to Nathaniel. Right. And then while I was doing that, I was like, oh, I got scammed. <laughs> <laughs> Wow.
Wow. Man. Yeah. Yeah. That that's, happened. That that's about the lowest form of low I could think. <laughs> That's a true story, buddy. Wow. Yeah, I don't think you ever told me that. I don't think so. Wow. God uh, damn. Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure that's the only uh, child pornography I've seen. I've never, like, accidentally downloaded any, thankfully. That's um, good. Yeah, it's... Uh, it stuck with me. I still remember exactly what the images look like. Oh, God, they're just burned into my brain. I, I I saw them once for like one second, you know. Oh. Horrible. Uh, oh my. Henry, speaking of um, sad things happening to children today, <laughs> yeah, we're covering um, one of the saddest things to ever happen to a child: the great Thomas J. And uh, we'll be talking. I thought you meant us covering these movies, and we were the children. I am bracing myself for a bad time today. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, All right. actually, no I, I was too. Um, no, I, think it'll, I want I think you it'll... to be honest about this shit because I, 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 I knew you were resistant to these movies going in. Like, these were not movies you were looking for. We're covering My Girl and My Girl 2. I mean... 256 of the franchise world. Thanks for joining us. Finland. Yeah, Australia. yeah, and over there is Henry, and I'm Daniel. We know that from from that game, um, that great song. So I uh, I chose these movies. I've always wanted to cover them. I fondly remember them from my childhood. My sister was really into the first one; used to watch it all the time, um, and I loved it too. I would watch it with her, and then we went to see My Girl Two in theaters, which I remember even at the time both of us were like amazed that was happening the fact that they made a second my girl movie yeah right i remember right. being eight years old and being blown away by that wow that's that's precocious yeah but uh but here it is my girl and my girl too and i love these movies uh re-watching them for the first time as an adult i've never watched them as an adult uh, mm. i still really love them and obviously, particularly the first one, because it actually has a reason to exist. Um, I, uh, how do you feel, Henry? How do you feel going in? Uh, going in, I, I wasn't looking forward to it. Um, I had, I've never seen the second one. I saw the first one in theaters. I was probably 13, depending on the release date in 91. I think I was 13, probably going into 8th grade or, or in 8th grade. Um, and, you know, I, I remember at 13... Did you have a crush on Klumsky at all? It would no, have been age-appropriate. Yeah, but I had crushes on, uh, on older women uh, way... Yeah, but you have, then. you know, like, can I, can I just say, like... Sure. When I was young, I mean, I know I was much younger than you when these movies were coming out. But right. I right. have this weird memory in my head that I, I I think I shared with Tim that I remembered Anna Klumsky being like developed by the time the second one came out. Like I remember thinking she looked like a kid in the first one. And then when My Girl 2 came out, I remember thinking she was hot now. Yeah, that's your age. <laughs> and and that's now like but like watching it now. They like it's three years later. She she like hasn't really no, aged much. Kid. She still she's looks like a child. Like she doesn't yeah. look appreciably different than she did no, in the she first doesn't one. To me either. Yeah. I uh, no. I th I don't remember that having a crush on her. I I was really still just. I don't know, man. Like go, uh, go, had crushes on like movie star actresses those were still like i don't know what it was i i was i'm trying to think like honestly like if there were like teenage actresses that i had crushes on when i was a teenager the only one i can think of off the top of my head would be like alicia silverstone so they were like sex pots that were basically almost women i guess when i was 13 to me I saw a, a picture of Alicia Silverstone recently at the premiere of Happy Gilmore, oh. uh -oh. and she's wearing a Happy Gilmore t-shirt and hat, and like I have never more wanted to fuck Alicia Silverstone. Oh, she looks good? It's like the premiere of Happy Gilmore. First of all, it's 1996, so oh, she looks I'm amazing. Sorry. I'm sorry. I, I was... 
retrofitting that to like how she looks now or something. Okay, okay. I that would know. be even cooler if now she was wearing a Happy Gilmore hat and shirt. <laughs> the saddest thing in the world. That's why I got kind of depressed. I didn't know if she's still hanging on to that, hanging on to that. But she wasn't in Happy like, Gilmore. It would be weird if she just like um hanging on to that one time I went to the premiere twenty five years ago. Well, preset. I uh, but I remember you know as a kid uh, in the theater. Uh, I believe I cried. Uh, I cried. I cried then. I cried now. So, but I had no desire to uh, to watch these again. Uh, to me, it's a. Did you see the kids. second one at the time, or was this a first time watch? This time, um, I never saw the second one. I, I don't even know if I was aware of the second one. If I was, I I wouldn't have paid any attention. I mean, that was ninety four. I was already going to Pulp Fiction and shit like that because I was sixteen. So yeah, I too I, cool. I, too cool for beautiful coming of age tales. I was sixteen. What am I? It's when you shun things, uh, you know. Um, but yeah, to me, it was just I wasn't looking forward to it in our run of films, just because of you know I uh, I had an idea of it, not having seen it for thirty years exactly. I guess thirty years, you know, the sort of what it was already going to be. Um, but you know. Thankfully, the first one uh, and the second one, to me, they're kind of this very similar, similarly made movies. I think a lot of that's from the Well, they're direction. definitely similarly made. Howard Zeif certainly yeah. has a but, style, Henry. I mean, they're not, they're nothing I'd really ever watch again. They have no value to me, but they were better made than I was expecting it, the first one is too. Why uh, does this have no value to you, but something for me, personally? I because it gives me no entertainment value. It just doesn't hold anything for me personally. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, What's entertaining ahead. about some of the movies you do like? You've seen my diary, right? On Netflix. Like you'll watch any um, boring horror piece of shit. We all know that, um, and you'll give it a, a three to four. Yeah. And so, like, what is it that gives, like, those movies, you walk away with no indelible characters whatsoever. You'll never remember a character name from any of those movies. You won't remember anything right. about those characters. What What's the name of the mom from the Babadook? Can you remember that? Uh, yeah, it was Audrey. Great. Uh, I mean, these these movies have very little when it comes to human feeling or emotion or experience. Um, and most of them are kind of just like using the same tropes and like, just like refurbishing them a tad. All right. Like so, what is it about those movies that have value as opposed to this one? Okay. Well, I'll read you the last <laughs> several entries in my diary. So this is what I spend my movie time watching. You can pull it up too, if you like. All right. So, like, last weekend, I watched the new movie by the, our American Splendor fit friends. Yeah, I watched that, too. I thought it was very good, um, and I loved the ending. And I was partial to it because of the art history. Then I watched Amy Simons' first movie, her directorial debut, Sun Don't Shine. Mm -hmm. All right. Then I watched a documentary on slavery, then a documentary on Beethoven. And then... I watched a documentary on Hemingway last week in a French film and a documentary on Napoleon and a, Fr and a documentary on civil rights. And I know you're rolling your eyes and then three foreign films. So it's not just that. So I you've had it. a week where you're refeeding yourself information that you've learned from a million books and documentaries that you've watched over the years. You just want to uh, you want a new delivery system of all that same information. So I like to learn. You're not learning. You know all this shit. No, I don't. I, you can never learn enough about certain subjects. But anyway, you you can learn a little bit about some other subjects. <laughs> you could stand to learn a tiny bit about a few more subjects. That's that's what I do with my life. That's all I ever do. No, you learn a lot about like six things, and then you ignore everything else. 
I had never really known much about Churchill, so I read a biography of him. I never really knew a lot about Napoleon, so I read a big book on him. Do you now care reading, about emotion at all? You don't think there's emotion involved in the human experience of the people I'm reading about? No. <laughs> okay. You don't... Look, I don't... You're oh, as you as you know. You're overly simplifying. But what do you I care watch. about the inner selves Great. of humans? You want me to watch movies about humans, about people, adoles adolescents, because it's an important topic to you. I having lived through it, it's just not my favorite interest of topic. That's all it is. As you know. Uh, or may not know the biggest uh, it's fun to look at the letterbox stats do you ever do that on your own thing sure. like yeah and i was a little surprised to see that the biggest category um not just year by year but overall in the whatever four thousand films uh, was drama so human stories always interest me i'm just m more interested in adult the human condition of adults. That's why I like Philip Roth and things like that. So that's just kind of more my thing. And so it just doesn't. But I'm interested in that too. I don't I'm, like, so, yeah, like adolescence have... is something you went through and you right. just ignore it. No, I don't ignore it. I just, I don't care to, it's not something like that guy. I, it's not an interest of mine, just like a lot of people aren't it's interested. It's something in... you went through. How is it not an interest of yours? But why would it have to be? I think, to me, it's valuable to see on screen when movies or television are trying to reflect something I've experienced. And then, sure. Okay, but adolescence is something we've all experienced. Hence, right, but you you really like to that's a that's a you don't you wouldn't agree that's a focal point of one of your main interests in movies or or even books. I think in movies, yeah. yeah. I don't know about books. Uh, I and it's not mine. That's all. It's not that I hate it. It's just not an interest of mine. I just don't get it. It's okay. the most interesting thing about the human condition to me. Adolescence. It's when you don't know anything. It's when you're figuring shit out. It's when you're flailing. I well, I, I I'm not as interested in watching Michael Douglas, who knows everything. Like he already has his life figured out, and like like the the most interesting thing about him is like a hot woman's gonna try and fuck him. But you're you're what you're basically doing though is dismissing all adult philosophy you're dismissing like the interest level of anything that's a developed mind because adults are liars <laughs> adolescents can't lie I'd everything rather... they're feeling is being shown to yeah. us uh i'd rather watch a movie like nocturnal animals that like delves into that type of stuff with like human relationships between a man and a woman that that stuff interests me great a yeah, great deal that's, more that's great uh, that's a great movie, and and of course that stuff is interesting. Like or like, uh, or like if Beale Street could talk. I like learning about things. I don't quite honestly to give you an answer. I sometimes I like watching movies about things I don't know about personally. I'd rather have if I'm not going to watch some trash, some fun horror trash or sci-fi or whatever or action. I do like to watch something that's like edifying, like a movie, a movie about adolescence that I found very edifying and gratifying was never rarely, sometimes always. That's something I wouldn't. Because it's specifically about abortion. No, but I'm not right. But it's about it, it has a political issue. Like you're only able to grapple to something if it has a political element. It's political to you, but it's also just personal for the girl in the movie. No, of course, and that's how I watch the movie. But I don't. But, if, but you wouldn't be able to watch a movie about a seventeen-year-old girl if it didn't uh, involve a hot-button topic. <laughs> I can't. It's so ridiculous. You'd be I into my girl if Veda had an abortion. No, it's still too uh, maudlin. All right. I don't know why I pick these movies. It, it, I don't know why you pick these 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 uh, strained 
arguments that aren't really based on on anything. I, I don't know. I, I simply don't share a certain interest in a type of movie. There's a reason why you have another show called We Love Kids Movies. This isn't love- a kids movie. Well, it's about kids, but I mean, that's fair. It's not a kids movie. It's a little dark for that, but it's just not something that would interest me. That's all. I watched the fucking movie and I spent four hours of my life watching it. No, you wasn't didn't. Miserable. No, I didn't? No, these movies are not two hours long. Uh, it took me two hours. <sighs> You're mad because what? I'm not going over the moon about the movies? You don't even know what I thought about them yet. No, it's fine. It's just... I pick these movies. I, I don't know. You pick movies on your week. You're allowed to pick whatever you want. I know. (laughs) You've wanted to cover these movies since literally we made our first list. I know, but you don't make it fun for me. It's like a bummer. Well, you've done that for me plenty of times. I get excited. I, I, you know, we did Pusher. I was all pumped yeah, for you. I announced that, you went, Ugh. Yeah, when I announced it, and then I watched the movies, and I gave him a chance. So did I. You don't, you're don't. you not even letting me review the movies. Tell you're me what a, you thought. Just review them. Stereotyping. Rip off the brand date. Just tell me what you thought. I thought that... Richard Mazur was my favorite character. He's rolling his eyes. There's no way I can win. By the way, I saw you gave this movie three stars before you erased your review for our show. Yeah, certainly. What's that about? What's wrong with that? That's a good review. I think five for as much as you love them. And they're it's not a five. In- of course not. All right. I was just, just surprised you, you gave it a three. Uh... I like the, you know, for me, I I think all the characters are good and well-developed. I think it's the style, and I think it's Howard Zeif Mm -hmm. that I think a more artful director would have made it a little more interesting and a little less. I know. Shame about all those well-developed characters. I can't say say anything. This is one of those episodes. No matter what I say, be it praise or not, you're going to be upset with it. So I won't say anything, and you just tell me how awesome these movies are. Go ahead. All right. My girl came out. (laughs) Let's talk about it, I guess. Uh, It was uh, the script was bought by uh, fucking Brian Grazer by this lady, Loris Elowani. It's actually kind of a similar tale to what we did with Romancing the Stone, where it was like a fledgling writer getting noticed by a big company for the first time and like selling off her baby. So, like, my girl uh, gets made into a movie, and then, like Romancing the Stone, she does not come back to write the sequel. Um, She goes off to other stuff. She worked on the Brady Bunch movie and a thing called the Amazing Panda Adventure, which I sort of remember being a thing. Um, uh, Howard Zeef uh, gets to direct the movie. He's a workmanlike Hollywood hack, you know? I'm That's not... what I was trying to say. That's all I was trying to say. I agree with that. Okay, then what's the problem? That was my main gripe with the with any of it, which isn't really even a gripe. Because, you just, uh, you, you come in, it's never, it's, this movie was never going to get higher than a two from you. It never even had a shot. No, that's not true. That's not true. I really believe that. All right, you you believe a lot of things about me that are so far off the fucking mark. I'm not sure if we just met. So continue. <laughs> All right. So I mean, this guy he was around in the 70s and he was a commercial director in the 60s. But uh, of course, um, my favorite thing he's ever made is uh, the main event, the uh, boxing movie with Barbara Streisand and Ryan O'Neal. Oh, yeah, very famous poster, sweaty Barbara Streisand in boxing gloves. Mm-hmm. Classic. He, he yeah. followed that up with the great Private Benjamin, which uh, has like three distinct parts, one of which is great, one of which is okay, and one of which is bad. I remember in the, <laughs> I remember in the 1980s, I had a relative who, that was like her favorite movie. And Goldie she didn't Hawn's have... amazing in the 80s. I love Goldie Hawn's 80s output. I'm a big fan of Wildcats, as I recall. Wildcats is awesome. Overboard is fucking great. Overboard's good. Yeah. Yeah. 
Bird on a Wire starts to take I've a never turn. seen that one. Starts to take a bad turn. Well, it but, takes a yeah. real bad turn. Once we get to the Banger Sisters, I'm like, bang yourself out of town, buddy. Oh, yeah, she's... Yeah. And then, what is the one with Steve Martin? We're the out-of-towners. Oh, yeah, sure. First Wives Club. Yeah, but Gold, Goldie Hunt 80s and also in 78, Foul Play. She's great. Yeah, so she follows up Private Benjamin with Unfaithfully Yours, which is... um. Uh, he does, I mean, which is a deadly, a Dudley Moore vehicle, Deadly Moore. I like that. Yeah. Then uh, the Dream well, Team, yeah. which I've never seen, which I think yes. Michael Keaton's in. I saw that. Uh, I loved that movie when I was a kid. There and you I know go. He, he directed that when I was looking this guy up. Uh, yeah, that's a fun Michael Keaton, I'm crazy movie. Yeah. yeah. The Dream Team, like, my girl could never get a similar rating like if you watch the dream team and my girl back to back the dream team would always have a higher chance mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. all right then he follows thing. then he followed that up with my girl and my girl too and then he had to retire because he got parkinson's disease uh, oh i wasn't expecting that yeah I, it's not where i thought the story was going what where did you think it was going I, I thought maybe he was retiring just because he got sick of Hollywood or got no, older. No, no, he would have continued making great films, including a third, My Girl, which was that in, another three star film. It was in development. It was going to be called Still My Girl. All right, oh, you would have liked that. I would have liked that, but he had another to retire. Three from Dan for a for a favorite of his childhood. I'm just a harsher grader than you, Henry. No, you're ridiculous. Not everything I liked as a kid deserves a five. You're ridiculous, grader. I'm not ridiculous. Yes, you are. It's, it's, it's laughable how, how, how harsh you are. What are you fucking talking about? I just gave that Tom Hanks movie a four yesterday. It deserves it. Mm. All you right. love my girl? Give it a fucking five. Who's watching? Jesus Christ. It's not the Nobel Prize you're grading. I'm not giving my girl a five. It doesn't deserve a five. I agree. I hate you. All right. Uh, the original title of the screenplay was Born Jaundiced. Ugh. Yeah. Uh, which is one of the opening lines of the movie. Um, and uh, they God. they couldn't come up with a title for a long time. Nobody liked Born Jaundiced. Uh, they announced it in the trades as being called I Am Woman. Uh, <laughs> Boy, they're really struggling over here. Yeah, and then uh, Brian Grazer over there on the Imagine uh, MGM lot or whatever uh, gave, um, or Universal, I think it was, he uh, announced a $500 reward to anyone who could come up with a suitable title for this movie. Uh, a lot of people came up with titles, and then Brian Grazer himself came up with my girl and decided to pick that. Brian Grazer is the guy with the crazy hair, right? Um, I mean, I don't think he you're supposed to think it's crazy. I think he thinks he's he looks awesome. Yeah, I saw him once after a gig on Bleecker Street. Uh come he was eating in a, ch- a sushi restaurant that I was with it, with my girlfriend and, and I looked at her and I said, "I think that's the crazy uh haired uh, Hollywood producer." See that talentless guy that makes money from movies? <laughs> He's very distinct looking when you see him in person. I was like, and I knew who it was then. This would have been like 2004, 2005. Yeah, and he's still doing that to his hair, and it still looks stupid. Yeah, it does. Fucking Brian Grazer. All right. Um, the budget for this film was $17 million. Uh, it ended up making $121.5 million at the box office. Uh came out November 27th, 1991, and it was the number oh. 22 highest grossing film of 1991. Wow. Right there between The Last Boy Scout and Boys in the Hood. Oh, all right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, this is the only one of those three I saw in theaters. Speaking of Boys in the Hood, let's talk about the Kids' Choice Awards. Oh, all right. We can do that. Here we go. It's the Kids Choice Awards. It's KCA, KCA to you. But it's the kids making the choice, making the choice, making the choice. Yeah. 
My Girl was nominated for Favorite Movie at the Kids' Choice Awards, um, and it lost to The Addams Family. Uh, I would also like to point out that the third nominee in the category was Boys in the Hood. <laughs> I shit you not for the Kids' Choice Award for Favorite Movie. How you know, did that happen and why? Probably because... Parents decided, enlightened parents maybe thought they should take their kids to see a movie about race relations in in the aftermath of Rodney King. Yeah, I can I'm see be, teens. I'm being optimistic here. But is that who's voting for the Kids' Choice Awards? I don't know. I, I, I Yeah. I, I, is that how they're compiled? They're just random? They... I have no idea. Oh, all right. Yeah. I, I don't know, man. That's, uh, you know. I assumed um, Stick movie. Stickly uh, compiled the nominees. I don't know who that is. Oh, that was a popsicle stick with eyes when I was a kid. <laughs> um, hey, Henry, uh, <laughs> the MTV Movie Awards also nominated this. <clears throat> I took my song list down, so I got to pull it up again. I want my MTV. Oh, I liked that rendition of it. Um, I mean, it might have been a different recording. Uh, M- MTV Movie Awards, Anna Chlumsky. Anna Chlumsky was nominated for Breakthrough Performance. Sure. All right, and she lost to Eddie Furlong for T2. Yeah. Yeah, I don't agree. By the way, with uh, the 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 KCAs, KCAs to you uh, choosing Adam's Family over this at all. You believe my girl's better than Adam's Family? Uh, Galaxy's better. I think they're both great. <laughs> no, you do. Uh, mm-hmm. All right, MTV also Chomsky and Macaulay Culkin, who played Thomas J were nominated for Best On-Screen Duo, and they lost to Dana Carvey and Mike Myers for the first Wayne's World. I mean, that's unfair. (laughs) You're going to agree with that one. That's not really fair to put two kids that are, you know, in the same category as two master actors as Mike Myers and Dana Carvey. I'll take Klumsky over either one of them these days. I know you would. I know you would. Well, these days. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's what I'm saying. She turned out great. She grew up good. Yes. Um, best kiss, Henry. This movie I'm won. Best. Really? Yeah. This is the winner of best kiss at the 1992 MTV Movie Awards for that time when Anna Klumsky and Macaulay Culkin kissed and then started reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. Right. Right, 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 right. When they did it, did they say under God? Yeah, they did, I noticed. Okay. Yeah, that was put in there. Uh, in this, yeah, I know. It, I thought about it. It was 1972 this movie takes place. By the right. way, I have some issues with the 1972 of it all. Yeah. All right. And and this is an issue, something I've noticed as an adult and that I didn't notice as a kid, but we've talked about on the show before. Okay. Okay. There is a lot of 50s music in this movie. And yeah, I it is, I assume, totally a result of Howard Zeef. The yeah. problem was, at this time, they were making a lot of movies for adolescents except they were all being made by boomers. And so Mm. they were all, like, doing their, putting their own influences in it. So I'm sure the woman who wrote this movie was younger, and she said it in 1972 to coincide with when she was a kid. But Howard Zeef, I assume, like, when he thinks about his own child, he he thinks, ting, tang, walla, walla, bing, bang, ooh, ee, ooh, ah, ah, ting, tang, walla, walla, bing, bang. Yeah, the music with... A couple of exceptions was the worst part of the movie for me. Um, I had to listen to some of that shit. I also had, it was also a little painful because I had to play a lot of those, some of those garbage songs in the last band I was in, as you know. Mm-hmm. Oh, God. I, I never want to hear Good Lovin' again. I don't Please think don't Smooth by Rob Thomas was in this film, Henry. No, I, I'm glad that wasn't, but it probably should have been just to annoy me. <laughs> uh, 
You know, it's an interesting point, though, because she's got posters, Anna Klumsky, right, like on her wall of mm-hmm. contemporary people. That's right. All Everything and, about her as a character is contemporary until you start dealing with, like, extra shit. If, so anytime we're talking about pop culture in dialogue from this time or um, non-diegetic sound, it's always just old-ass shit. Yeah, yeah. There's, like, I, one Credence song in this movie, and then, like, everything else is from the fucking 50s. Like, they play I that, Only Have Eyes for You at one point. Yeah, I know, I know. She I, goes, I, to, I, she goes to, to, to moon over her teacher that she's obsessed with, and she plays, um, what, Wedding Bell Blues? What's that song? That awful song, is Bill, uh, Always You. Yeah, I... I, I oh, uh, yeah, I, I love you so, uh, always. I with. hate that fucking era of music. I kind of uh, like that, that song. The genre of that genre. I, you know, I, I was think actually, you, you, you hate surprised. it arbitrarily, though, because of Barnes & Noble. I feel like Barnes & Noble really I've, outraged you with how often they played that shit. Well, that's, that's a, that definitely affected it, but I, I also just never... I, I like, like, a certain music from the 50s, I guess we're going to ascribe it, early 60s, probably. Um, but some of those just girl groups and, and, and ballads, I just never... I never liked. If I'm allowed to not like that, I know that's uh, I'm, it's not my you thing. Talk shit about the Beatles on the show. I'm sure you're allowed to not like whatever you want. I don't want you to to, to get upset. Um, <clears throat> but I mm-hmm. actually gave something in this movie. You'll be surprised at. I gave the movie the benefit of the doubt, and I was just trying to think like, all right, it's 1972, maybe the girl is sort of listening to music that like her dad well, is has going in the house or listens to down in the the basement. That occurred to me too. Her mom died in childbirth right. and she doesn't have any real friends her own age except for weird Macaulay Culkin. And so, yeah, uh, it's okay. very possible she's just into whatever her dad's playing. Yeah, and her dad's did. like a fucking nerdy guy who runs a funeral parlor and plays the trombone. The two I mean, of us, excuse me. I don't think she's getting exposed to like Jimi Hendrix and fucking Janis Joplin, and you know. I, and I was just kind of thinking, like, I think we tend to in our time think about like everything's an oldie or like, but really in 1972, songs she's some of the songs she's listening to are only like ten years old. Yeah, so it'd be like if we were listening to like, um. I don't know, like Psy. Like if I would put on like Gangnam Style right now. Yeah, if you put on... Should if I? You, if you put on Circus, <laughs> Britney Spears. Circus is good. If you put on... If you put on Franz Ferdinand. Oh, classic, yeah. Hey, Henry. I don't know why I'm playing Gangnam Style. I just wanted to hear it. You want to cover Blade in the club scene? Is oh, that would be great if they were dancing a Gangnam Style and Blade. <laughs> all right, Henry. Yeah, go ahead. Let's talk about this movie. Uh, all right. So basically, the setup of the movie is the exact same thing as the <laughs> Nanny. If you've ever seen the Nanny, um, so <laughs> the show. Yeah, the show, the Nanny. So you've mm. got a father, played by Dan Aykroyd. He's, a, he's Mr. Sheffield, okay? And he, his wife has died. Uh, it's in childbirth in this. It was not in The Nanny. I believe she had a wasting disease. Um, and uh, uh, Dan Aykroyd has a daughter named Veda Sultanfuss. She's um, a very precocious sort. And she's, uh, you know, very smart for her age and unique and um, specific. Uh, Very interesting character. A great character to hang a movie on, I believe. She um, grows up into, uh, you know, an 11-year-old or whatever it is. And then somebody comes in, So you know... She shows up, at, somebody shows up at the door, but the father saw more because she had style, she had flair, and she was there. She had some great joie de vivre, and I'm talking, of course, about Jamie Lee Curtis, all right? JLC. She shows up to the door to um, apply for a job. You know, the, it's a funeral parlor, so they need somebody to apply makeup 
to the corpses to make them look beautiful. And uh, so she comes in for the job. She uh, gets along with the kid, gets along with the dad, and she's there. She starts working there and uh, becomes a mother figure to Veda and at the same time falls in love with Dan Aykroyd. Which is one of the harder, the probably the hardest part of the movie to believe. <laughs> I I disagree. I think this is the best. I love this version of Dan. I like it too. No, I like it too. It was on, on, it was really just on a cosmetic level. It was just really funny to watch, like Jamie Lee Curtis fall for this schlubby aging. Dan I know, Aykroyd. but he doesn't look yeah. that bad at this point. Like I, honestly, I, like three years later, it would have yeah. been harder to buy. Like. You know, know, the Dan Eckert of My Girl 2. But and I, then I was thinking about like 1972 and I was thinking like, all right. I mean, honestly, I've I've seen so many couples that were like married around that time who are still together. And it's kind of like, yeah, there's an imbalance that was probably there. In no, but Aykroyd looked cool as shit in 1972. No, I mean, 1991 Aykroyd playing 1972 Aykroyd. Aykroyd looked cool as shit. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I meant in real life, you you see couples and you're like, oh, I could see that standards might have been different back then where they were were just happy to get a decent guy who wasn't like taking LSD and fucking, you know, or or marching for Nixon or some shit. So, yeah, it was it was believable. Although there is a twist ending of this movie. That reveals uh, that um, Veda and Dan Aykroyd have been heels all along. They love yeah, Nixon. I, yeah, I didn't know how to take that. <laughs> I, I didn't know if that was like her. I I took it as her childhood naivete and just thinking it, that, that is what, what it's supposed to be. But I think it, it it plays really funny now. Yeah, it does. It's very funny, and um, I mean, he probably is a Republican. Everybody is. I assume he's, everyone's he's, a piece of shit Republican now. I know you do. Uh, well, he's in. Uh, they're in Pennsylvania in a rural town. So it's yeah, were you, I was going to ask you if you were familiar with this town. No, wh- what's the name of the town? I didn't know it. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I uh, no, I wasn't. Um, Madison, no- Pennsylvania. No, but nobody has the ugliest accent in America. Voted in 2014, which was the Pittsburgh accent. So they can't be anywhere near there. So I assume they're in Central. Did yeah, you know but that, I I did know that. But on the same list, they say yeah. the sexiest accent in America is the Boston accent. So I'm going to take issue with that whole list. Well, don't take issue with the choice of Pittsburgh. It's totally true. All right. Yeah. 2014. It didn't recoup the uh, <laughs> the award. Um. Wait, so. Yeah. Veda also has a mother figure in the house. It's uh, her grandma, uh, which is her grandmother that has a, a Alzheimer's and is uh, is cutting it close. She the, G-I-L-P. the actress and the character will be dead by the uh, <laughs> the second My Girl movie. She's my LVP. Why? Because I don't think she's necessary. I think that uh, every other character in the movie has some great stuff to do and she's kind of thrown in there for some comic relief but it's kind of just whenever they cut it's not just comic relief when she like showed up at that one funeral and freaked everybody out like that was all right that's not funny it's distressing singing a a song from the uh, 40s i mean of course it's funny it's meant to be funny Mm. i think it's also supposed to be like horrifying though yeah, but I laughed a little. Mm, did you laugh a lot at this movie? No. Uh, I cried more than I laughed. Well, just the last 15 minutes, right? Yeah, I I was actually, uh, I didn't cried, but choked up. Like a lot, like very, you know, when you got it behind your eyes, too. Sure, yeah. I got that watching I- um, something yesterday. What was it? I got I cried really hardcore at something yesterday. Wow. I can't remember what it is now. <laughs> oh, it must have been The English Patient, because I know you watched that recently. I didn't cry at that. No. Yeah. You uh, don't care about adult relationships. I don't I don't even know what you're trying to say. Exactly. Uh-huh. Uh, all right. My- anyway. Um, so- I like to know what made you cry, though. In this movie? Oh, no, no. The movie you watched. Yeah, me too. I wish I could remember. Um I'll think about it. It was probably a yeah, TV no, show. I did not expect. 
I thought I would cry more at the only sequence I had any recollection of, which was the bees. Um, I also, in my mind's eye, had had that scene uh, as being more graphic. Me too. I remembered it that you see him running away. Like, the you see yeah. the bees chasing him. But I guess I was thinking of that scene earlier where he and Veda jump into the water. Okay. And I was thinking nothing was done. Like, Z- Zeif, Zeif like cuts it to like this slow mo kind of It's a shot it, of uh of the kids glasses on the ground like oh <laughs> like yeah yeah and I didn't recall that at all and I thought there was like a longer scene not that it needed to be I mean it's horrifying but I, it's not what I recalled and then but I thought that was the scene where I was remembering choking up but no, it was it's afterwards it was, when when it's he's, everything after yeah yeah he's in the the coffin all right so at the end that, of the movie that, fucking macaulay yeah. culkin's character thomas J is this kid he's like allergic to everything and uh at the end of the movie uh veda has dropped her mood ring near a uh a b thing by the way my sister had a mood ring there's so much from this movie that I was able to remember it as being something my sister and I said when we were kids or That's that my nice. sister owned because of this movie. My sister bought hats to look like Veda. Um, yeah. Wow. I loved these these characters so much. So, I know. so Thomas J, uh, he gets stung by the bees near the end of the movie and um, he's allergic to bees, so he's dead. Uh, so there's this killer scene where Dan Aykroyd reveals that to Veda and both of them are amazing in that scene. Yeah, they're very good. Yeah. And um I and the That's... scene where Macaulay Culkin's in the coffin and she jumps she runs up to the coffin and he doesn't have his glasses. He won't be able to see. Uh, but there's also I I as I recall she has a scene with Jamie Lee Curtis that got me too. Uh, I'm trying to remember, though. Well, the Jamie Lee Curtis Veda relationship is, I think, the centerpiece of the movie. I love the way, like, Veda immediately loves her when she comes to the place. Like, she hasn't had a woman in her life of this right. age and of this relative youth that, yeah. that can, like, really walk her through some of this shit. We actually do see Veda get her period in this movie, and, like, Jamie Lee Curtis walks her through that. Um, I, uh, and then Jamie Lee Curtis starts dating Dan Aykroyd, which I love that sequence of their first date. And I remember as a kid being pissed off at Veda that she was getting so mad about this because isn't that exactly what you would want? But it's, it's different. It's compartmentalized. Yes, she loves Jamie Lee Curtis and yes, she loves her dad, but she's also still traumatized from losing her mom in childbirth. She blames herself for her mom's death, which comes up more than once. And um, and her dad's all t- he's all hers. Yeah, he's absolutely. A, she doesn't want to share him with this invade invading woman. And um, but yeah, the, but I was just gonna say before I forget, I, I think that also the scene at the end when they see Thomas J's mom outside. Yeah. Fuck. That was tough. Oh my that god! Was... Oh, maybe that's what I'm thinking of that made me cry really hard. Veda, <laughs> Veda, when she tells her that like her mother is going to be watching over uh, Thomas J yeah, in yeah. heaven, and I don't Jesus, that. I don't need that in my life. You know, yeah. I actually love the way this movie deals with um, religion because, like, not really religious at all. What? It's not overly religious. It's at all. not overly religious, but it is earnest about religion. Like it doesn't hide the fact that they are Christians, yeah, and that Dan Aykroyd attends church every Sunday. That's true, yeah. And that they have, you know, that's Christ- to be expected. They're a small Pennsylvania. No, town. of course it is. And so I love that they didn't shy away from that, but it's not presented to us either as this moralistic piece. No, it's it's really not. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Um, and Jamie Lee Curtis comes to us at a really interesting time in her career. It's it feels so oddly transitional, where she still has a little bit of that like Laurie Strode ingenue in her delivery, but like she's like less than ten years away from being a diarrhea yogurt salesman. <laughs> 
Well, I was trying to place it too because I was thinking of like this is eight years after trading places with Dan Aykroyd. Yeah. And three years before True Lies. So this really is a transitional period for her. Like, what is she right now? Like, even seeing her in this movie, I was trying to remember, like, what I thought about her at the time. I guess, like, Fish Called Wanda was a big deal. Maybe yeah. that was her calling card around this time. Yeah, for sure. That's and why she's was... getting a role in a mainstream comedy. Yeah. And, I, I mean, I, I, I always just, even from childhood, I just remember her at that time seeing her in this movie would have been like just knowing her from trading places in Halloween, not even for me, Halloween. Cause I didn't really get into that movie at all at that age. So like for me, she was like a light comedian. You this know, is probably I, I, the first thing I ever saw her in. Oh really? I guess. Well, I mean, like I'm thinking true. about it now. Like what would I have watched her in? I don't know. Well, you're fucking five years old. Yeah. I mean, I... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Your ridiculous memory of things when you're fine. But, yeah, no, oh, I remember what I knew her from, too. I never saw it, but I remember being, like, 12 or 11, seeing previews for it and thinking, ooh, what is this movie that I know I shouldn't be able to watch? And it was it was fucking Blue Steel. I knew you were going to say Blue Steel, because that did have, like, a memorable cover. I remember yeah. seeing that at Barnes & Noble, at Barnes & Noble, at Blockbuster as a kid, and thinking that movie was like, oh, that's a cool adult movie. Yeah, Blue and it's so Steel. not. There's what like is one that sex scene. It's a decent movie, though. I watched it a while ago, and I thought it'd be a complete piece of shit, but it's actually also by Catherine Bigelow. Yeah, Which, I know that. Uh, people forget that. No, you know that. But a lot of people forget that movie's in her oove. And it's kind of a cool movie. Before Ron Silver went completely fucking insane in real life. Well, now he's dead. We can look back on him fondly. Can we? Ron Silver? Do you know what he turned into? No, I mean, just a horrible Republican, right? Horrible. You know what's amazing I is that... They did that on um, the West Wing. Like, there was a storyline on the West Wing where Ron Silver played, like, a Democratic campaign uh, strategist. And then in the universe of the show, they had him switch to the Republican side. And then he did it in real life. And it's always so crazy to me when art imitates, when life imitates art like that, because he went through the story and, like, the storyline on the show was partly about what a fucking hypocrite and what a joiner he is and like then he just does that really like he wow. learned nothing well he was one of those guys uh 9-11 he just completely switched um everything and i i remember something he him and philip roth used to be really good friends mm -hmm. and he used to redo the audiobook versions of philip roth books and they got in a huge, huge argument over, like, Bush and 9-11 and all that kind of stuff. And, and Roth never talked to him again. Ron Silver was a Jew. 9-11 uh, so <laughs> really ruined a lot of Jews uh, because a lot of them, a lot of us don't know what to think about the Middle East because Israel is a confusing issue and we just... Uh, pledge our allegiance to Israel at the expense of everything else, and um, that's how you tell a smart Jew from a not-smart Jew. It's <laughs> very funny. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's Philip Roth. Philip Roth was, was Jewish, obviously. He didn't, yeah, they didn't see eye-to-eye -eye on that issue. No. Let's talk about some uh, subplots. You you brought up uh, you really enjoyed Richard Mazur in this film. I really enjoy him in this too. I like him a lot oh, more yeah. in this one than the sequel because I think they sort of take away a little bit of what makes his character interesting to me. One thing I like about this movie is everything we learn about the adults we learn through Veda. So like we'll hear 
Dan Aykroyd talking about Richard Mazur to Veda, and then we'll hear Richard Mazur talking about Dan Aykroyd to Veda. And so, like, everything we're learning about the adult characters, we're learning through a filter of everyone else's opinions, and we're learning it through however Veda is taking it in. And I really like that. So, like, you know, there's, like, a sequence where Richard Mazur is on, like, a, a swing with um veda and they're having he has his arm around her and they're having like a a great uncle niece discussion about his father or about her father what her father needs and then later on in the movie you get like a little conversation with dan Aykroyd where he just mentions that richard mazer's character fought in korea and it really fucked him up yeah and it's so interesting to add that information on top of that scene that we got earlier. I really think there's some interesting storytelling narrative stuff happening in the script. And I don't necessarily think the direction is playing it up like it maybe should be. But um, but I really think the screenplay is good. So why did you roll your eyes at the beginning when I said Richard Mazur was my favorite character? Uh, it just seemed like a you opinion. Oh, I see. <laughs> Sorry. Whatever. I yeah, I liked him. I I liked the uncle character, and I liked his relationship with his brother. You know, I I I, I always I, I I like when he's like giving him the most horrible advice about women. That was very funny because it's like a complete setup, and you know it's all wrong. Yeah, yeah. Oh and right, think- but you know what's great about that is like that's a real sitcommy thing that Richard Mazur like sitcommy. Richard May. I'll tell you why. Because Richard Mazur tells Dan Aykroyd to like not treat her like a gentleman on their date. Doors. Yeah, because, yeah. uh, like, women's lib, like, they don't like that or whatever. So, in, like, a sitcom, they'd have Aykroyd do that, and then they'd have a heart-to-heart about it. And I loved that he never lied to her about it. Like, Jamie Lee Curtis says, like, something's been That's off it. on this date. And he goes, what do you mean? And she goes, you didn't open the door for me in the car. And he just immediately goes, oh, God, my brother, he told me this whole thing. Like, women now don't want that. I love that he just owned up to it right away. And Jamie Lee Curtis was like, oh, that's dumb. And then they were right back on the same page. Well, because I also was wondering that they set that up with Mazur and Aykroyd. And you think you're going to see some of that. But you don't. And so then when they get back into her, like, I think, trailer, I think is when the conversation yeah. about happens. I was kind of thinking, like, oh, that's too bad. We didn't really get to see some of that slapstick or, or could have been kind of funny. And then and then she says it. And then the way he says it, you're right. He just tells her and she's like, oh, OK, yeah, that, that makes sense. Like, she's under – she's – uh She's understanding that she's on a date with a guy that hasn't been on a date in, like, two decades. That's why this isn't a kids movie. Like, we don't lean... There are easy laughs to be had in this movie, and we very rarely lean into them. We disarm them, almost. Yeah, I mean, the protagonists are kids, but it's a... You know, I mean... I. I, I I don't know. I, I don't really care about the categorization of it too much. I'm just saying, it, it, you know, it's a movie that was marketed at kids for sure, obviously. My sister and I saw it. But I, I really think that the screenplay holds up as a as an adult screenplay. I think one of the th- only, th- you know, one of the things that didn't work for me also, because it's odd that they don't come to it too much. I mean, I was happy they didn't. I didn't like it. I'm sure you did. But... I didn't care for the fourth wall stuff. I, I didn't understand. I don't like that either. Oh, all right. I don't yeah. like that either, I, and I kind I of wish sick. they got rid of it by the second one. Like, the the second movie opens with her at the table talking to the camera the same way the first movie did, and it's treating it like, oh, remember this iconic <laughs> thing from the first movie? But, like, I don't think when people think of the first movie, they're like, remember that awesome scene at the beginning where she talked to the camera? I Nobody gave a that. shit about that. I didn't remember that at all. When she starts the movie, in the, the first movie, talking to the camera, I was like, what the fuck is this? Yeah. Like, I don't remember that at all. I'm all right with the narration. Like, I, I do think that's, that's done all right. Different. 
yeah. but it's different when different. she addresses the the camera. Um, what did you think of the subplot featuring an and Griffin Dunn credit, um, where he is? I like that. Yeah, so he's her English teacher, and she's in love with him. Yeah, and I like. I love Griffin Dunn, and I like. Uh, there's something about the we you've talked about this before in movies that we've covered and i have too because you don't see it that much anymore there's just like it might sound like naive but there's a amiability and niceness and sweetness to some of these characters that's just kind of nice there's like no ulterior motive like griffin dunn and jamie lee curtis and dan Aykroyd are just like good people yeah this movie's not seeking drama right so it's nice when like griffin dunn just has like a nice scene when he's painting his house and he's just like talking to the kids like a teacher on summer break would talk to two yeah. kids who know to, and he's just like a decent nice guy and i think and he has the right reaction like when she shows up to his adult english class that he's teaching over the summer and at first he's put off by it he's like veda what are you doing here? And right. then when Veda says, like, well, I want to be a writer, he, like, embraces it and is like, well, sit in. Let's see what we can do. Yeah, I mean, I think that's of its time. I, I think uh, today they'd ask you for, you know, your check and make sure that you... He, oh, he, well, yeah, for sure. And, you know, they would... be paying off that class right now. <laughs> yeah, and they'd get permission from, like, nine different adults. And, <laughs> it, it, you know, it's ridiculous now. But, like... I, I do think like um, they would still do that now. Like they, a rich kid would end up in a class like this. Yeah. No one just has any money anymore. Everything costs money. That's that's right. Hundred K, baby. What what's a hundred K? Oh, just money I owe the government. Oh, it's gonna be gone soon. I think I think. Oh, Biden's, sure. I think Biden's gonna expunge student debt. He's not gonna get that done, my friend. I think I, he will. I'm starting He's to think so. Page. I keep thinking we're going to stop talking about it, and we don't. About what? Like I see it in the news every day, fucking student debt shit. Ocasio-Cortez never shuts up about it. So great, right. let's fucking do it. I agree, but that, that don't, I don't see that happening. I'm never paying. In, I'm, I've decided I'm not going to pay my taxes this year. I'm going to see what happens. That's not a good idea. Who cares? You, you're going to get in trouble. Why? What are they going to do to me? find everything out man i don't care okay what are they gonna well, do what are they gonna take my money they could garnish your wages remember when the loans they already do in new york they already do what are you talking about they garnish my student loans you you know they, your salary at your job I'm they're not about. gonna do that they're gonna take they're gonna garnish my tax refund but i'm not oh. gonna have one because i'm not doing my taxes if you can live with that, uh, it's still legal, but okay. I don't care. I'm done with the government. I'm off the grid. Oh, look at you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, I love that scene where she goes to see Griffin Dunn when she runs away from home and like her, his fiance is there. And uh, and she gets upset and runs away. Griffin Dunn is great. He doesn't get enough credit, I don't think. He's on that show This Is Us right now. And he's like the mm. best part of the show. Yeah, well, Griffin Dunn for me will always be immortalized in After Hours. Yeah, After Hours and American Werewolf in London. Those are the two biggies, right? I've never seen and is on my list of things for me to cover. Of course, I also have this fact that I could pull up at a moment's notice off the top of my head. I happen to know that Griffin Dunn directed the very fine film Addicted to Love with Meg Ryan and Matthew Broderick. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> That's a true story. I think he might have also directed Practical Magic. He absolutely did direct yeah. <laughs> that. With two, uh, that movie used to send me into conniption fits. It's a terrible movie. Oh, it is, but the two leads in their prime of... of... I know, Oof. they're your, your, your people. All right, uh, well, what a fine film. What do you give it? I give it a three. Well, I'm happy to hear it. I think it's a four. I'm going to bump up my grade to a four. Um, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. I mean, why not? A, what's what's about what about it? Let's flip the tables for a second. Mm -hmm. What about it is lacking for you? Um. Well, I just I, I think um, 
I think it's probably in the direction. I think there's a nice specificity to the screenplay. Uh, like every character feels unique and most movies like are so concerned with moving the plot along and and making sure we're caught up on everyone's backstory and like learning all the things we need to know to like get through the story and i prefer movies and television shows where there's a specificity to ca- the characters i want them to st- to tell boring stories from their past that don't actually matter to the plot i want to know what movies they watch what music they like to listen to i want to mm-hmm. i i want to know things about their day-to-day lives that matter i want to know what mood they're in when they wake up in the morning i want them to talk like people and too many movies they're only talking about the fucking plot and we never get to actually know them as characters and my girl doesn't really have a plot it's just a fucking coming of age story, and it has a beautiful specificity to it. I really think everyone is real. Veda is is such a great creation of this screenwriter, and Anna Klumsky in her first role, you know, she gets an introducing credit. She brings it to life incredibly. Like she's a real fucking find. And I remember being shocked when Anna Klumsky disappeared after this. I always thought she was gonna have a big career. It seemed it was like. When Anne Hathaway showed up in Princess Diaries, everyone was like, yeah, she seems like a thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's how Anna Klumsky seemed. And I was so happy when that movie The Thick of It came out. Or No, that that was the TV show. That was the TV show. I'm sorry. She was in the movie version, In the Loop. Oh, yeah. Right. But, okay, now I have a question. In the Loop predates Veep? Yes. Uh, Armando Armando Iannucci created The Thick of It. Right. Then wrapped the thick of it up in the movie in the loop, and then did Veep. So she was gone for that long. She's really in nothing from like 1997 to like 2009. Wow, maybe she was in college or some shit. I'm sure she was. I'm sure she was working on figuring out what she actually wanted to be, and then realized she wanted to be an actor, and that's yeah. a worthwhile thing to do. I think a lot of times. Actors are better when they come back after a long hiatus like that. In the Especially loop a kid. Is great. In the Loop is fucking great. I love that movie. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, yeah. The, so, it's not a five for me because it's just, you know, I thought a lot about the movie The Man in the Moon, which came out around the same time. I didn't see that. That's a coming of age movie with um, Reese Witherspoon in a in a similar kind of role. Oh and, yeah, yeah, right. I didn't see it though. And right. that is an indie movie that feels incredibly real to me, and I think that's probably I probably have that as a five on I should on Letterboxd. Mm-hmm. This to me feels like the mainstream version of that movie, so it's not quite on the same level. There's a little too much crowd pleasiness happening but i think it's easily a four yeah i mean i think that for me there's a little too much maudlin in the tone of it um and the authenticity Does the score but... hurt that do you think yeah i felt like the score was the most um sticky it, part of the movie it's very sticky it's it's in your face a lot yeah um and, you know, you can make fun of me for not wanting it to be a little more auteurish, but I think it could have really been something else with a better director. Like, it really could have been yeah, I would a love... powerful, powerful movie from beginning to end if, if, if it had a, a lighter touch. Nothing has to change with the characters. Nothing has to change with any of that. But it's just so workmanlike that it's just like... I, it's just disappointing that it was done in such a by the numbers way that I think it could have been something much much better. You know, it's weird that like directors now, like when they hit, they automatically go to superhero shit because that's the most popular thing. Like I would love to see someone like Eliza Hitman who directed Never Rarely, Sometimes Always, instead of like jumping into the mainstream i don't know what she's planning on doing next but it'd be interesting to see her do a slightly more mainstream version of what she does already and something like never really sometimes always or like chloe zhao is directing like the eternals next like wouldn't it be more interesting for her to follow up nomadland with just like 
a slightly bigger budget, more mainstream yeah, like, drama. How it used to be before yeah. the superhero thing took over, and I feel that way. Did you see that great movie from last year? Um, I can't remember her name. Uh, she directed uh, "I'm Your Woman." I didn't see the movie. Ah, oh, but you know, you've heard of it. Yeah, I, I am your woman. Of course, was the title of this movie. Right. Um, <laughs> there. Uh, well, you should see pieces of a promising young woman. I'm yours. I know they're all all movies are the same now. I'm your promising pieces of a young woman. <laughs> all great movies, but no, it I know exactly. Revenge. Revenge is one of the the jo- the genres we make now. I'm not. I'm your woman. Isn't isn't a revenge movie? No, I thought it was. No, it's fucking great. Is it a pressure narrative? That's that's another genre that we make movies. Uh, out. No, it's actually kind of like a little uh, crime movie. And, wow. And there's a large portion of it that takes place in Pittsburgh at a bar I used to go to constantly, which Amazing. is very, very funny. Yeah. D's Cafe, everyone. Shout out to D's. Anyone who watches I'm Your Woman, it's in there all the time. You remember when Magoo's was on uh, The Outsider? We got all excited <laughs> about that. I never remember what show that was, and I try to tell people that at work, and I, I can never remember it's The Outsider, because yeah. HBO floods my brain with all these small-town stories. Um, Who's your MVP? Hey, are you watching the Winslet thing? Yeah, it's great. It's great, right? I knew it. <laughs> it's great. All right, your MVP is Richard Mazur? Yeah, I, I think he's great. He's a great He's a great un- Uh-oh. thing, man. He's got great lot. He's great in risky business. He's great in everything he's in. Yeah, I guess I'll just straight up go Anna Klumsky. It's totally fair. Who's your LVP? Gramu? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't need that. Gramu. I'll go with the bees. I don't think they should have killed that kid. That's not. <laughs> I'm just joking. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. The bees um, are just mostly minding their own business. I mean, you don't have to throw shit at them. And knock no, them actually, you know who my LVP is? The doctor. I I never think... It's always so underdeveloped to me that Veda is a hypochondriac. Like, I understand the need to do that because, like, she's worried she's going to die at any moment, but... Yeah, it is weird, though, because they... It is a bit under... It's funny, but it is a bit underdeveloped because... You know, it's we we are to infer a lot, like because her mother died and she's around death, she thinks she's dying. But the thing that's weird about the that in the movie is that she never seems upset about it. She seems to want to be sick, almost like a. Well, I think an, I think sickness is a fact of life for her. Like she's grown up right. in this funeral parlor, knowing that her mother died at the moment she was born. So like, death is pretty regular to this girl. I think it's just a good setup for the end, though. Oh when, yeah, for sure. She, she can run in there, and she's hyperventilating. That that's what it's all. Do what did he did he dumb did he do? I didn't like any of that, but <laughs> come on. What do you think of Macaulay Culkin in the movie? You know, we we haven't covered him since uh, Home hey. Alone. Well, he's a lot better in this. Um, I know, but he is better in this. But he's still kind of a blank slate. I agree. I I never thought much of him ever. Yeah. Um. Uh, at all. Uh. He doesn't. He's not really in the movie, thankfully, that much. I heard his uh, dad lobbied for this role. He wanted him in this. Like Macaulay didn't really have any interest. I think they were looking at Elijah Wood, like at first, and then like when Macaulay Culkin showed an interest, the studio was like, "Well, yeah, let's get him." Of course, of course, yeah. yeah. I mean, it worked. The movie made over a hundred million dollars. Yeah, it probably he, wouldn't he, have. He's fine. Uh, you know, uh, he's okay. I mean, it's the, probably the best movie he's ever been in. I'm. I don't know that I would at all disagree with that. <laughs> I mean, the only other contenders are like Uncle Buck and the first Home Alone. Uncle Buck's fucking great. Yeah, I love Uncle Buck. That's I'll take favorite. this over Uncle Buck. Yeah, no fucking way, man. It's got the Candyman. <laughs> sure. What role would he play in this? The Ackroyd role. Uncle. Oh, the uncle. <laughs> that would be good if John Candy and Ackroyd were brothers in this. That'd be fantastic. Yeah. yeah. My Girl 2, Henry. There's a My Girl 2. 
Yeah, I didn't know. I mean, I knew, but I, I just didn't, like, ever. I do not remember this movie at all coming out. I was there. All. I was there opening weekend, baby, with bells on. We it's saw it. 94. We saw yeah. it in theaters. We loved every second of it. We came home talking. My sister had a poster of Austin O'Brien on her wall. <laughs> okay. Action hero. That, yeah, that's right. The last. What a career he had, by the way. We'll get into it. Um, I didn't know he had one. So I'm I mean, not anymore. But like in the nineties, he's in like a million things. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh-huh. Janet Kovalchik is our new writer, which which must be remarked upon. I have no information as to why Loris Elavani was not participating in this movie maybe she was contractually obligated to work on the brady bunch movie or something but i mean she's nowhere to be found in this fucking thing and you can totally tell because all of the specificity that i talked about regarding the first movie is gone everyone is just like a dad or a mom or a teen now no nobody is their characters veda is not quirky anymore except when it matters for a joke and fucking you know it's like everyone's got like a token thing we see dan Aykroyd with the tuba but he's settled in he's just a dad we see jamie curtis hanging around but like her main storyline she's pregnant like i do think like the the actors manage to inhabit the characters again, and they still do have a beautiful, like, familial bond in that first half hour of the movie before she goes off to L.A. But I just think that tonally, they don't got it. That's interesting. I, I didn't expect you to say any of that. I mean, I... I uh, it's going to sound weird, but I, I didn't feel that much of a difference in the tone of the movies i mean well because you have howard zeef and you have james newton howard and i do think they're propping it up trying to make it feel consistent i think the problem here is with the screenplay well yeah but i mean the central conceit while very familiar isn't a terrible one to have her want to find out about no, it's fine. Or, it's a good episode um, of a TV show. Yeah. Well, I mean, I could say I, I think both movies could could really be done like that in a way. But this that's one because is- you think any movie that isn't enormous, it doesn't deserve to be a movie. OK. Um, <laughs> <laughs> would you let me ask you, would you like my girl if it was 135 minutes long? No, no, it'd be done. With, you'd hate it. You'd yeah, it'd be hate way it. too long. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Maybe I need to attend a seminar where, to to cure me of liking 145 minute long movies, and you need to attend a similar parallel seminar in the next classroom, like to get you over like anything over 86. Minutes. I'm pretty sure I'm doing that right now, Henry. All I'm watching right now is movies that are two hours and 45 minutes long. <laughs> so. <laughs> Come on! I mean, look at what I've watched this week, Henry. What That's exactly life? what I'm doing. Is that right? What? Here's what I've watched recently. The Last right. Temptation of Christ, Troy, yeah. The English Patient, Avatar, Out of Africa, Anatomy of a Murder, The Bridge on the River Kwai. This is what I'm watching. Wow. You watched Troy? Yeah. And you know what? Troy's all it's- right. <laughs> so it's okay i saw you gave it a one and i think you're wrong i saw it in the theaters man that movie is insufferably bad i think it's good oh. i think it's a good movie yeah i know you you, you gotta be rated it the same as you rated the english patient uh it's great well yeah it's great, it's great. <laughs> i had them both at a two and i popped them both up to a three very discerning i am discerning i'm so discerning all right <sighs> All right, My Girl 2. This was released February 11th, 1994. I'm 15 at the time. Uh, Yep. Um, You're seven. (laughs) I'm excited, baby. Uh, uh, And I don't don't have a budget for you on this one, but the box office, without Macaulay, my friend, we are about $100 million less. This movie made $28 million. 
Ooh. Yeah, it came in at number 80 at the American box office between uh, Wes Craven's New Nightmare. Okay. And uh, that remake of Miracle on 34th Street. With <laughs> I saw that in the theater. <laughs> yeah, the guy who directed Gandhi as um, Santa Claus. God, my mom must have like come home for the holidays and drag me to that. Or I saw that in theaters too, man. I think I was a real Mara Wilson head at the time, though. I saw anything she was in. Doubtfire. Yeah, yeah. Mara Wilson and, and teen. You know, at that age, you follow child actors. At your, the age you were. Yeah, yeah. I was like, I'll watch Tina Majorino in anything. That's how I felt at that age. <laughs> Oh, man. Oh, boy. All right. So, can I... Um, oh, so... Uh, oh, that's everything. Can I bring up Austin O'Brien? <laughs> yeah, you must. So, he's the melee of this movie. And the last one, we got, um, of course, Macaulay Culkin as, like, Veda's best friend slash pseudo-love interest. And, um, you know, he holds his own. He's Macaulay Culkin. Everyone's excited to see Macaulay Culkin in a movie. Yeah. So they needed a replacement for him in this one. They hired this fella, Austin O'Brien. Um, now, at, he, he's coming off Last Action Hero pretty soon, right? Last Action Hero. Well, his first movie ever was The Lawnmower Man. All right? He's uh, in, which I also saw in theaters. Yeah, he's in that, and he's in the sequel. All right? <laughs> so we'll cover him. Then he does Last Action Hero. He's the fucking lead of that movie. I'm I'm cons- I'm convinced Austin O'Brien has more screen time in that movie than Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> that movie's awful. It is so. I still love it. Like I love. I watch that movie every few years, and every time I watch it, I'm like, this is a piece of shit. But like for some reason, I pull it out. I hate that movie. <laughs> I, I know. I think it's- so bad and i should have loved it i should have loved it when i saw it i was the right i i just hated it i thought it was so poorly done and depressing yeah it's a bad movie so austin o'brien is also in another franchise around this time that we'll cover henry it's called prehysteria okay all right and it's about these little mini dinosaurs (laughs) imagine jurassic park but the dinosaurs are tiny. Okay. All right, that's so, pre hysteria. So it's not re- it's not related to the Maggie Gyllenhaal uh, nymphomaniac movie, Hysteria. What's that? I've never heard of that. <clears throat> Isn't every Maggie Gyllenhaal movie a nymphomaniac movie? <laughs> yeah, <it was> kind <laughs> of a, she's uh, she likes uh, sexual uh, topics. All right. So then. Austin O'Brien, he's the lead in My Girl 2. He goes on to so much after this, Henry, including the Babysitter's Club movie, including an episode of ER, including the show Promised Land. He was on for three seasons and 69 episodes, which was a spinoff of Touched by an Angel. Wow. All right. Now, it hasn't gone great for him after the 90s, I'll admit. I have seen him in one episode of Bones as an adult. Uh, he grew oh. up, he grew up kind of ugly, unfortunately. I'll be honest. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't, doesn't look good on an adult because he so is. We didn't get any drugs, he seems we didn't have a no, 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 no. He, he seems fine. Like I don't think he like was a fucked up adult. That's good. Oh, by the way, I, there is a sad thing that I left that I didn't mention from the first movie. Awesome. Um. So you remember in the english class with griffin dunn how they're those like hippies that like are really like supporting veda yeah. one of them's that woman who like i'm gonna read yeah. a poem what? that's gonna be sexual what? and and then there's that dude who's like yeah veda will help you out for sure he what sucked. he sucked? sucked i mean he was fine in did that he suck world. talk about no, no, no. talk on him give your opinion no, 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 no. I, <laughs> Come on. What did you think of his performance? I thought it was fine. Mm-hmm. I thought it was all right. Yeah. Did what he needed to Yeah, do. He, he died of AIDS, like, right after this movie. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> like, before the year was out. <sighs> <sighs> yeah. 
Yeah. For more on, a, uh, on that topic, uh, check out our Friday the 13th Part 2, I believe. Yeah. Actually, for more on that topic, watch the current season of Pose. They're just, like, inundated with AIDS on the show. It's a bummer. Yeah. All right. Um, we, we... But you're, of course, talking about the uh, our friend Wheels, who um, was murdered in Friday the 13th <laughs> continuity by Jason, but in real-world continuity by... By the the Hiv, yeah. <sighs> Henry, um, so uh, that's Austin O'Brien for you. <laughs> so the film starts. You know, Curtis and Aykroyd did not want to come back. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. They were perfectly fine. They felt one my girl was enough. Uh, I guess they felt the same that America felt. Um, and uh, so they they were going to tap out, and it was actually Zeef. Who convinced them? He he was like, "We'll work with you. You'll only be in like the beginning of the movie," and uh, and he's the one that that convinced them. By the way, there was a, I, I, is it in the first movie or the second movie where Ackroyd has a line about conspiracy theories and aliens where he's saying like how fucking stupid they are, and he's like, "Next thing you know, you'll be thinking that," uh, and it was hard to watch uh is it because dan Aykroyd is a known um believer in aliens that what do you mean psychopath um i just meant uh he went completely off the rails henry i thought dan Aykroyd was insane for years okay i love the documentary he made dan Aykroyd unplugged on ufos i've watched it multiple times in my life uh it's incredible film um for years i thought he was a maniac you know he has that crystal skull vodka which is stupid and uh i but i'm turned around henry Mm -hmm. you know the cia is really putting out a lot of information on ufos now Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know i'm keeping up with all of it are you uh no well, you should be, because I've always believed in aliens, all right? Nah, nah, nah. I've always believed in aliens. I've never thought they've been to our world. I felt that we just haven't encountered them yet. Mm-hmm. Um, but now, I think there have been aliens all along. Yeah, because some pilots saw some weird formations in the clouds. I read those reports, too. Um, but now we've seen video of those reports. And those are what? UFOs. Uh, I see. Okay. Henry? Henry, yes. you are looking at me right now like I'm an idiot. No, 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 no. I know you're not an idiot. Not at all. He took his glasses off. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I fucking did. Um, listen. No, I, ne- but next. Uh, <laughs> UFOs are fine. real. <laughs> Next, I want you to tell me about my sign. No, come on. I don't believe in that bullshit. Astrology is stupid. Astrology girls are stupid. They're like Harley Quinn girls. I I think I mm. just... Now we've seen visual proof. Like, I have seen oh. videos of UFOs. Uh-huh. I, they're unexplainable. <sighs> the government doesn't know anything. Henry, what... I, this Do you have a buffalo skin uh, vest in your no, closet? No, this absolutely drives me insane. That, like, aliens have been the thing that humans on this planet have been interested in the most for the years. Like, those are the most popular movies. Alien movies. Independence Day. The Day the Earth Stood Still. Okay? Classic films about aliens. The Close yeah. Encounters of the Third Kind. All right? Now, mm-hmm. E.T., all right, it was the highest grossing movie ever made until sure. it was beaten by Avatar, another movie about aliens. No, I skipped a couple of winners in between those two. Um, listen, now the United States government yeah. is releasing information and yeah. hard facts about yeah. aliens and all of us. Mm-hmm. Or just turn a fucking blind eye to it. It's right there yeah. on the internet. Go look. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
All right. Okay. Henry. Yeah. What's up? I might be spending too much time on Reddit. <laughs> I get it. Reddits have those threads, man, and then you just keep going. You get addicted. I get it. Mm-hmm. But I really do think that aliens have been roaming the earth. Henry, uh, okay. what a film. Uh, Dan Aykroyd, yeah, he, he believes in aliens, and I love him. So all my anyway, the point of that is that I now believe in Dan Aykroyd. I don't think he's crazy anymore. I think he was right all along. All right. And Dan, I have a confession for you. I believe you're crazy. Well, I don't want to join the ranks of Dan Aykroyd here. Well, I'm sorry. You just did, buddy. Sign up for the Aykroyd Army. <laughs> well, Henry, why do you want to be some kind of a sheeple? Do the research. Learn for yourself. <laughs> all right? You're into science, aren't you? I am pro-science. Oh, all right. Hashtag stop the steal. Henry... Um, this <laughs> so, um, Veda wants to, she's doing a project for school, right? That's the thing. She doesn't want to fuck her teacher in this movie. It's just some random teacher. And, um, they have to write a project about somebody they've never met before. So most of the kids are doing like Spider-Man or whatever, but she yeah. chose her mom because she never really met her mom. Her mom died. Like right after she emerged from her fiery abyss, and um, so uh, she flies. You know, I don't like this stuff with the mom in this movie. It it, it is a stumbling block for me, and I, I'm going to tell you why. Okay, it's one of those things that just makes the first movie feel different to me. Because in the first movie, you're not told anything really about the Ackroyd mother relationship. You can just assume. Yeah. They had a nice relationship, you right. know? Yep. And uh, in this one, it's stated that the mother was an actor from a traveling acting troupe who yeah. met Aykroyd in town and then nine months later had Veda and then gave birth to her. I just so, think, yeah. like, Aykroyd being Veda's father is less emotional and less interesting to me if he never knew who the mom was either. Yeah, I know. And also, it's it's a ridiculous red herring because then you spend half the movie wondering... Uh, if he's uh, the dad. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And, and it destroys any... It's like, what are we doing now? Like, now we're going to have her meet some uh, bearded uh, cabin dweller. That's the best part of the movie. And then she sees, yeah, you mean like when she watches the movies of the mom? When she, the, the whole sequence with the fella she thinks is her father, who was like her mother's previous husband, yeah. um, that's my favorite part of the movie. And that guy is my MVP. I think it's the best performance in this movie. And I had to look up the actor and learned that he's not an actor. <laughs> Really? Yeah, he's a country musician. Oh, that makes sense. Uh, not a bad sequence. I just don't like the conceit. I, I, I don't understand. I, but you know, I, but I you know what? I do. I think it's necessary. worthwhile that she walks in there thinking the guy is her dad. And he just like immediately when he realizes that about her, puts his hand on her shoulder and says like, Hey, do you think I'm your father? Because... I'd be honored to be your father. You seem amazing. Like, it's very let's nice. be in each yeah. other's lives. But, uh, but let me walk you through this. Like, let me tell you the truth. I really liked. That. But I was, I was confused about something though. I, I maybe I was my attention was waning. But did did I did they resolve? He never tells Dan Aykroyd about this guy. Does Veda never tell Dan Aykroyd about this guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think Veda ever tells Dan Aykroyd that she's suspecting that Aykroyd's not her father. I would assume that when she flies back to Pennsylvania after this, they talk about it. Okay, but they don't ever... She never has, like, a throwaway line or anything like that, like, about it, right? Like, it's not like a... I think Veda thinks it would hurt Dan Aykroyd's feelings, I also think once we fly away from Pennsylvania, we do not have access to shoot scenes with Dan Aykroyd and Jamie Lee Curtis. Yeah, no, I, you're right. This, 
And I think that's what lends it the red herring aspect because, you Even know. Even though they are first after, and second build in this film. Yeah, I mean, afterwards, there's a monumental sequence. So it's just kind of like, if we're not even going to discuss it, I mean, why are we led to to think this? And I, I don't know. It's, it's very odd. It's very odd. I thought this stuff in the um, garage, Richard Mazur's garage, um, didn't really work. No, nor did to, I. I was waiting for you to say that. I wanted to fucking also, I wanted to punch everybody in that garage. I mean, the first of all, Richard Mazur himself is just like he's playing so a different character clueless. in this movie. Yeah, he's so fucking clueless about his girlfriend. His girlfriend's awful. Like she's like openly ridiculously playing with this guy, and then this piece of shit in this car. I'm like, God, I don't like anybody's behavior. In yeah, did you remember the, the fucking piece of... Did, did you recognize the piece of shit in the car? I, but I didn't look him up. It's the uh, Phantom of the Paradise himself, Garrett Graham. Oh my god. Wow, another horrible movie. An insane casting choice. You know, I never watched these movies back-to-back before. Like, I watched both of these a lot as a kid, but I don't think ever in a row. And I honestly don't think I ever made the connection that the Richard Mazur character in this movie and the Richard Mazur character in the previous movie are the same character. I, I understand. That's that. how different they are. They look different. Uh, yeah. They talk different. They have different character traits. I mean, he's in a relationship in this movie, and he's just like he was like a womanizer in the last movie, and now he's like right. this milk toast fucking wallflower yes. in this movie, I don't like obsessed it. Yeah. with Christine Ebersole for no reason. Yeah, I didn't get that who either. The, who the same year played um richie rich's mom so she worked with macaulay oh there you go um and uh yeah so that whole sequence i i mean we go back to that garage a few times and it never really works no it doesn't and a a lot of his characteristics from the first movie are just they're all just sort of missing they're softened everything is softened in this movie just less specific that's what i'm saying and, and, like, he kind of just sits on the couch. Like, even when the kids go out to L.A. and roam around the streets of Hollywood and they come back and they're late and they're mad, the folks are mad, she's mad, the mother, but he just kind of sits there on the couch staring. And you, the uncle of the first film would, like, would go up to her after and be like, hey, it's all right, I totally get it, you're in Hollywood, you're fine, don't worry about it, I'm not going to tell your dad. Mm-hmm. You know, that kind of thing, and he doesn't you don't give him anything. Um, so he sends his nephew, Christina Ebersole's son, Austin O'Brien, uh, do we remember the character's name? Um, Noah. (laughs) Nick. Uh, you know, and first of all, I think he looks too modern. I think he looks like a fucking 90s kid, and this movie is still supposed to take place in like 1973. Um, That's right. This is, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, you never even talked about the heel turn at the end of My Girl. Heel turn? You called it a heel turn. The Nixon comment, I guess, is what oh, you meant. Well, all it is is like um, a voiceover at the end where they say, they're saying, like, and everything was okay after that. And, like, one of the things they say as an example of being okay is ironic. He says, and Richard Nixon just took office, you know. Um, yeah, he got renominated. Right, right. Yeah, by the Republican yeah. Party, she says. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, which, you know, learning Veda is a Republican with two seconds left in this movie is very <laughs> annoying. <laughs> um, but anyway, back to the second one. So also, Brian goes uh, on this, like, sojourn to learn about her mom. They find her mom's yearbook from high school, and they go to, like, um, talk to all these people like her mom would have known. So first is this like police officer who was like a hall monitor that got her turned in in high school or something. Right. And th- this is played by Keon Young, uh, the uh, Asian actor who, in my head, I simultaneously know as being Mr. Wu from Deadwood and the guy who sold Jesse and Chester their sweatsuits and Dude, Where's My Car? <laughs> <laughs> oh god all right so uh he's great uh i hate the character but i love the actor 
And uh, then they go see Ben Stein, where I hate both the character and the actor. Agreed. And, um, and he's a fucking drip and grinds the movie to a halt for the next five minutes. And, he's, and he says, does anyone want an opportunity to win my money? And everyone's was like, su- no, go away. I was surprised that he wasn't more Ben Steiny in this movie. Yeah, um, he's actually playing a role. Like, usually when Ben yeah. Stein shows up in a movie, he's just like, oh, he's Ben Stein. Right. But yeah, no, he's... He- He's he's talking a little faster in this. He's actually yes. playing a character, and he like yeah. used to be in love with the mom, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's funny to see that. Yeah, I know. And he's still nursing a crush on her. Dudes are disgusting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she never knew that I existed, but I loved your mother very, very much. You're anti-Semitic. Um. Anyway. <laughs> I like Nixon. By the way, those Jews that uh, that believe uh, Israel is the promised land at the expense of everything else in the Middle East, that's Ben Stein for you. Um, True. And yeah. I believe Ben Stein worked for Richard Nixon. He was a speechwriter for Richard Nixon. We right. hear a Richard Nixon, Nixon speech in this movie, and I wondered whether Ben Stein wrote that's it. Right. right, that's right, that's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Even though Nixon was not fond of Jewish people. No, he was not. I've heard the slurs. Um, the tapes are great. <laughs> yeah. Um, the the most nonsensical part of this movie, the part I understood the least, was there's this whole section where Veda is really into this fictional poet, and then they uh, go yeah. see him on the street. That was so fucking dumb. What was that doing in this movie? I don't know. They go up to his apartment. He offers them nothing in in way of enlightenment about the mother. And there's no reason for it at all. It is so extraneous. It's like, it's noticeably extraneous. Yeah. It it has nothing to do with anything. Like, you really need this to be 10 minutes longer? Like, what? What? It was very odd. It I, adds I th- nothing. He's my LVP. I, yeah, I thought the buildup would be something uh, to it, but uh, there's nothing at all. It's very, very strange. Indeed, Henry. Um, uh, so what else happens in this? You know, They start to like each other a little bit. They have a kiss yeah. at the end. I remembered like there being like a sexy makeout at the end of this movie, and it's such a chaste little 12-year-old kiss. Yeah, well, they're still kids. Well, I mean, it, this is, again, just from me being seven when I saw this. <laughs> like, that kiss probably was like, oh, my God, they're kissing. Right, right. <laughs> it was hard to discern the ages anyway. Like, Well, uh, she says she's 11 in the last one. And I assume this one is, like, n- maybe two years later. I, I assume she was, like, 13 in this one. Yeah, I mean, they, they look... In the first one, I thought she 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 looks like she. I don't know her. I didn't. I don't think I looked her age up. She, I mean, she looks like she's nine in the first one, like very young, maybe ten. And then in this one, she's she's like probably like to me like look like an eighth grader at most. Yeah, that's what she is. I think. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't know. It, it's 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 a little strange. He looks older though. And then how about this? If if if. Then at the end, they even comment on it, right? Like, if they're going to be related in some kind of way, right? I have some questions about this. What? Because at first, when they're flirting, I think it's fine. Like, so his mom is going to marry her uncle, all right? That's that's the relationship. So that would make they're going to be step cousins like that's not that bad like okay wh- step cousins right so but right, what, right. It, the thing is like when they were first talking i wasn't thinking about it at all and then they don't share their first kiss until after his mom becomes engaged to her uncle and i'm like i feel like now is the point where you take a step back. Like, if you were already dating at the time they got engaged, I feel like that's maybe all right. Well, but, that but, would but you can't accurate. now get together. <laughs> it's ridiculous. And you're 100% going to break up because you're 13. And then you're going to have to see each other at family shit for the rest of your life. And they're 3,000 miles away from each other, so it's never going to work. There's going to be some weird shit down the line where they're both like 
38 and he's drunk and he's trying to get her to give a blow job to him at a funeral it's gonna be a bummer <laughs> not a hummer <laughs> no full blow all right um <laughs> anything else you want to talk about in this movie I mean, I don't know, not not really. I I I didn't think it was that horrific, you know. I no, I, I think it's pretty good. It, it it's watchable. It's it's just not. It has no reason to exist. Right, right, yeah. Um, oh yeah, Jamie Lee Curtis uh, has a kid. I'm very happy we didn't. We were spared a birth scene. Uh, I don't Ugh, want. Agreed. I, don't want to see another one of those. I thought we were going to get one for sure. Um, mm-hmm. Oh, she, oh, I'm seeing on Wikipedia. She got an A plus on her essay. I didn't remember that. Oh, I don't remember that either. I remember in her class <laughs> at the beginning, one of the kids is um, is Brian Krakow from My So Called Life. I got excited about that. God, you have fun watching these types of movies. <laughs> yeah. I don't know anybody in these things, man. Um, yeah i mean i i give oh she gets her ears pierced oh yeah right she he actually doesn't want her to do that because she'd get alien transmissions from the ears pierced hey man i trust them Mm -hmm. um i give it two i give it a two as well uh who's your mvp Uh, anna klumsky Mm, yeah i I'm mean a, she's still fine she's still carrying the fucking movie so. she's she's great i'm gonna go with jd souther who played yeah. the man she thought to be her father there you go uh and uh her mom's also good by the way and you know there's some interesting casting in this movie that i actually appreciated her mom we see on the video just singing yeah, who is that? she's her name is angeline ball she's um She's an actress, but at this point, this was only her second credit. The only thing she'd been in at this point was the great uh, Alan Parker's The Commitments, which, you know, I think she was singing in that oh. as well. She Irish? She's an Irish actress, yeah. Oh, all but right. But she doesn't have any lines in this. She's just singing, so, like, you yeah, know, it didn't matter. True. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, so there you have it. My Girl 2. And my, who's your LVP? I mean, it's between two people. Well, for me, I, I did not like this character, and I think she fell into the realm of 90s women writing. Um, Ebersol. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Well, she's just a fucking nag. And yeah, she she's has a good- hassle. That's what women were in the 90s, a fucking hassle. Yeah. Yeah. And, and she's just, she's awful. I mean, and she's just an odd character yeah. and i just did not i didn't like her for the uncle and i didn't like her for, <laughs> I didn't her. Like her for the uncle <laughs> I, I, I think richard mazer's character could do better frankly they totally could mm-hmm. they totally could so she's she's my lvp she's just a fucking nag yeah my lvp is the poet guy um I, I, I do think one could also go with Austin O'Brien, who is an enormous fucking step down from even Macaulay Culkin, who we're not huge fans of on the show. No, um, no. The, the LVP, the actor's name is Aubrey Morris. He was actually in A Clockwork Orange. Do you recognize him from that? Oh, holy shit. I think he's the pervert at the beginning of the movie who's like uh, Alex's school master who like comes to the apartment in that famous sequence he's like trying to sexually molest him don't you remember that yeah i mean i, I do I, if that's him i, I would think never know that's that that's him i think that's him Holy. i i only know him from um fuck the, uh, from the wicker man he shows up in that what's his name aubrey o'brien Aub- aubrey morris you're oh. you're conflating him with austin o'brien that i am <laughs> Aubrey Morris. That's right. And he died, by the way, in 2015. And according to IMDb, his cause of death is undisclosed. He was 89 years old, gang. So somebody oh, please just... solve that mystery for me. <laughs> oh, he's also in Love and Death and Bordello of Blood. That's good. Uh, I've seen him in four films. Yeah, I'm just checking out to see if I'm right about his Clockwork Orange casting. Here it is. Let's see. Aubrey Morris... 
Yeah. All right. That's him. The, the perv and clockwork. That's right. All right. So what a fine perv he is. Frankly, I didn't trust him in that apartment with those two youngsters in this either. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's my LVP. Um, they're ranked one, two, of course. Listen, these two movies are on HBO Max, and they're a fucking delight. I guarantee everybody watch. I, I mean, I recommend everybody at least watch the first one, right?